Good evening, and welcome to the Bread of Life Evening Bible Study. I am so excited. We are going to be getting together in our parking lot this Sunday to celebrate Pentecost Sunday. You should be hearing from us either by email or telephone, depending on how we have been contacting you. We will give you the details of that. And pay attention to the time because it may change. Uh, so be open to that. So I'm very excited about Pentecost Sunday and this Sunday. Hope to see you there. As you know, I have been doing the series on the power of the blood. And I have covered seven areas that Jesus bled from his body where he redeemed back for us things that we lost in the garden. This is number eight of the Power of the Blood series. And this is the last of the series. I will be completing it tonight. But before I do, what I want to do is let you know that we will be doing communion at the end of this teaching. So what I'd like you to do is, if you get a chance, is to grab um, a cup. If you have grape juice, great. If not, use water. Jesus turned water into the wine. Uh, and a piece of bread. And it would be fine to partake of communion in that manner. If you are not saved or born again, please do not partake. You need to believe in Jesus Christ to be able to partake of communion. Now the thing that I want to cover in this session is the fact that the purity of the blood of Jesus and the blood that he shed at that cross was a pure blood. And the significance of the virgin birth is all important because the virgin birth produced a human being with sin-free blood that was not of Adamic origin which means was not in the line of Adam's bloodline because we know that Adam's bloodline was contaminated and that sin nature was passed on. So God had to bypass the, the sin nature of man and produce a pure blood to be shed once and for all for our sins. Now we all remember that without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness of sins and we remember that the soul is in the blood. Now, an, an egg that a woman produces is blood free. It only, be, the blood only um, is produced when the male fertilizes the egg at the moment of conception. Then the blood system begins to develop. So it does not come, did not come from Mary. What Mary simply did is she supplied an unfertilized egg which God used to prepare the body of Jesus Christ when the Holy Spirit overshadowed her. So what we understand and see is that Mary's blood at any point in time did not commingle with Jesus' blood. Now a baby's cardiovascular system is a separate entity of its own. The cardiovascular system that pumps the blood is the baby's own blood. It's the mother's does not. In the placenta, the mother's blood is on one side, the baby's blood is on the other side. The only thing that comes through osmosis to the baby is nutrients and oxygen. So again, the mother's blood never touches the child. So where did this blood came, come from? There was only one place that Jesus' blood could have come from and it was not of human origin. It was heavenly origin. It was his heavenly Father. And we see that in John chapter 1, verse 14, and it says, The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. So, the blood of Jesus was pure, uncontaminated by any of Adam or Eve's blood. God found a way around that. Not found a way, God is God. He knows how to handle it. In, in Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 8, uh, chapter 9, 10, and 11, talks about the Levitical priesthood. And what that is, is that is when Moses, uh, along with the Israelites, were given the law, 
in order for God to be able to have connections with his people because God could not, could not see sin. He could not be face to face with sin. There needed to be a blood atonement. So during the time that the Israelites uh, were tra uh, traveling through the desert and finally settled in, they had the, um, the temple and they had the priesthood set up and the priests would sacrifice the sacrifices for the blood atonement. Now in Hebrews it tells us that Jesus was a priest, a high priest. He was in the order of priesthood. So I want to bring you to something I covered last week in John chapter 19 verse 30 when Jesus said it is finished and he gave up his spirit and we see that all through scripture verses that Jesus gave himself. Jesus does two roles here and this is what Hebrews tells us is number one as a priest Jesus is pure holy, blameless, without sin, and he is above all things. So what we understand is that Jesus, as a priest, is sinless. Also, as the sacrifice, he is sinless. What Jesus did in John chapter 19, verse 32, he operated as both priest and sacrifice. As a priest, in the Old Testament, the priests had to sprinkle themselves with blood because they had the sin nature before they did the sacrifice. They had to purify themselves and then do the sacrifice. In the case of Jesus, there was no sin. He was pure, he was holy, and as a priest, he offered up the sacrifice, which was him. He was the sacrifice. And him, and he, as being the sacrifice, was holy and pure as well. So this sacrifice that Christ did covered all aspects of any sin nature that would be there. Jesus took care of that. Now, I want to go to Ezekiel, and I completely forgot last week to cover this part of it. And this will probably explain to some of you, if you're new on this and you're trying to figure things out, I want to talk about the born again experience. Because of what Christ did at the cross, because of the purity of the sacrifice and his blood that he sacrificed for us, he made it possible for us to be forgiven and covered with the blood. And here in Ezekiel 36, verse 26, it says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees. This is the born again experience. When you realize that you're a sinner in need of a Savior and that Jesus is that sacrifice to forgive you, cleanse you, and put you back in right standing with his heavenly Father, you become born again. Now, we become born, that's why it's called born again. It's because when we were born physically the first time, this time we're born spiritually. When we make that commitment to Christ. We become born again spiritually. And that's important. And what happens is we are given a brand new heart. We are a new creation in Christ. So if you ever had an understanding or didn't understand what people were talking about when they were saying born again, it's simply this. It's being born of the Spirit. And it says we're given a new spirit. Now what we need to do is we need to read the Bible so we can catch up and renew our mind with what has happened in our spirits. And you've heard a number of the teachers talking at this time, and probably you had questions, and this might have answered that born again experience. Not only that, not only do we have a new heart, but in Hebrews chapter 4.15, we now have access 
into the throne room of God. It's amazing. When Christ died, the curtain in the temple, the Jewish temple, tore from the top to the bottom. Now, that was a thick curtain. No one could have taken it and torn it, but God did. And what happened is the Holy of Holies came through. And the Holy of Holies was made available now to anyone who would receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior. So we have, in prayer, we can access the throne room of God. We can literally come into the throne room of God because we are covered in the blood. God does not see our sin. The sin question has been taken care of. There is no issue with that. And now we can come to him in our time of need. And Jesus, who is our high priest, who understands our weaknesses, who also understands what it means to be tempted above and beyond, who also understands the struggle that we go through, that we can literally come into that throne room when we are struggling with sin, or we are struggling with temptation, or we are struggling with something in our life, that we have that access now. I want to go to uh, Hebrews chapter 12 verse uh, 24 and <clears throat> one moment. 12 24 of Hebrews. Now I'm going to talk about the fact that the blood has a voice. And this is where I wanted to go with this. The fact that the blood speaks. So in Hebrews 12 24, it says, and I believe I'm in the wrong place. I'm actually in Romans. Okay. Hebrews 12, there we go. All right. 12, 24. Now, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkling, sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Now it says that the blood speaks of a better word than Abel. Let me explain something. After the fall, Adam and Eve had two sons, Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel both offered up sacrifices. Cain offered up a sacrifice from the ground. Abel uh, produced a sacrifice from his flocks, which meant there was the shedding of blood. God favored Abel's sacrifice. Cain was extremely angry. Now, it's very well known that the possibility that God did not receive Cain's sacrifice is because it was from the ground, which was cursed, where Cain would have given the vegetables and the produce that he had to Abel and purchase one of the flocks to offer up before the Lord. But Cain was doing it his own way. He was approaching God in his own way. And he became angry when God favored Abel's sacrifice. And God warned Cain of his anger. Cain killed his brother out of anger and jealousy. He killed his brother. And when God appeared to Cain, he said, where is your brother? And Cain said, am I my brother's keeper? And God said, listen, I hear your brother's blood calling out to me. So the blood has a voice, and the blood cried out to God. So in here it says a better voice. The blood of Jesus has a voice. And I'm going to begin telling you what the voice says. Now we're not hearing voices, but the blood speaks. And what I want to do is I want to go through what the blood speaks. And what we're going to do is we're going to pan over to the communion elements right now. And as we pan over to the communion elements, I want you to listen to what the blood is about to say about you, your situation, and who you are. So I just want you to look at the cup of the blood and the body of Christ, okay? And now listen to what the blood is saying. And this is what the blood says. I am the blood of purification. You are made pure by me. I am life and I am light. I am the blood of illumination. 
I say the light of my blood is in you right now, driving away spiritual darkness. You have to. You have no reason to fear evil. Evil fears you. I say you will never dwell in darkness. You are now in the kingdom of light. I am the blood of deliverance. I say the devil has no claim on you. I say you have been acquitted and released from the place where you were once held prisoner. I am the blood of salvation. I quickened you and I translated you out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. I am the blood of the cross. I tipped the scales of justice in your favor. I have satisfied the courts of heaven. I say your account is balanced. I say your debt is paid in full. I say there are no outstanding claims against you. I say you are free from warrants, liens, and summons against you that Satan, your accuser, would try and accuse you of. I am the blood of promise. I, it was I, the blood of Jesus, who went into the holy presence of God for you. Heaven stood at attention as I ratified the new covenant, which is a far better covenant with far better promises than the old. I say your covenant benefits are available now and forevermore. I am the blood of the testament. I guarantee that you are a beneficiary of the new covenant. I promise all that God has is yours and all that you have is God's. I am the blood of abundance. I promise you a good life. I promise you long life. I promise you unconditional love. I am the blood of hope. I say you have hope and a future. I am the blood of sprinkling. I say to the destroyer, you shall not come here. I say to the plague, you cannot come nigh this dwelling. I say to the pestilence and the storm, this child of God is under my protection. Be gone. I am the blood of Passover, and I call out, this one fears God. The blood of the Lamb has been applied above this dwelling door. Evil cannot enter this place. Now I want you to shout with me. Sickness, pass over. Poverty, pass over. Death, pass over. I am the blood of access. I certify that you have been approved to enjoy all the benefits of heaven. I am the blood. I am royal blood. I attest to your royal birthright. You are born into the kingdom of God. I testify that you are a son or a daughter of God in good standing. I am the blood of dominion. I have been applied to your life, and I have made you a king. By me, you rule and reign. I am the blood of authority. I certify your authority and dominion. I say... You have kingdom authority. And because you have kingdom authority, you shall also decree a thing, and it shall be established unto you. And the light shall shine upon your ways. I am the blood of virtue. I promise, I pronounce you 
curse free. When I was applied to your life, I imparted the very life and nature of God into you. I am renewing your strength and your youth. I say you are empowered to live life to the fullest. I am the blood of blessing. I am stronger than death, stronger than disease, stronger than poverty, and stronger than sin. I profess you are too blessed to be cursed. I am the blood of healing, and I impart life and health to all your flesh. I say you are a vessel of God containing the treasure of divine life, for I will restore health unto you, and I will heal you of your wounds. I am the blood of atonement. I have made you at one with God. I am the eternal sacrifice for sin. I am ever before God. There is no other sacrifice needed for sin. I settled the sin problem once and for all. I am the blood of eternal life. I say you have nothing to fear in death. You passed into life when you trusted in me. I am the blood of warning. Tell others to heed. It will be a day of woe for those who have not placed their trust in me. Without the blood of the Lamb, none can be saved. I say, warn the wicked while there is time. I am the blood of accessibility. I bid thee come. The day of salvation is here. Hear me. I am the blood of assurance. I say you, your past has passed. I say here before God stands a new creature. I say hear me, no one shall prevent this one from living the good life. I am the blood of inheritance. I testify that you are an heir of the royal inheritance. The king's estate is yours. I am the blood of the new creation. I am the blood of fidelity. I say when God says, you shall speak a language I speak here. Hear me. I am the blood of the seal. I have sealed the book. I have sealed the promises. I have sealed your salvation. I have sealed your inheritance. I have sealed your destiny. I have sealed your future. And your future is secure. I, the blood, have sealed you forevermore. I am the blood. I am sacred blood. When you partake of the Lord's table, you partake of me. I say you are forgiven. I say you also have the power to forgive. I say sin's curse has been broken. I say you also have the power to break any curse. I am the blood of communion. By me, you are united with God in holy communion. I say, you are in the family of God. I say, nothing whatsoever can separate you from the love of God. Now that we know what the blood says, this is what the blood says about you. And if you have your elements, 
we will be partaking now. I think you got a very good idea of what the blood speaks and says. If you get a hold of every bit of this, this can bless you and in ways I can't even imagine. When you are sh sh secure and sure of what God has done for you, nothing can stop you as a child of the King. So here we have before us and what all of what we have talked about and all of what you have learned comes down to this. Now I've talked a lot about the blood and the cross. The one thing I have not talked about yet was the resurrection power, the baptism in the Holy Spirit, and the glory that is to come. And that will be future Bible studies. But if you have your bread ready, what I'd like to do now is as Jesus said on the night that he was betrayed, this is my body which was broken for you. At the cross, every part of Jesus' body bled in one way or another so that you could be redeemed. His body was broken. And in this body, when we partake, we partake of the forgiveness of sins, healing, healing in our body, in our mind, in our soul. The healing goes beyond all that we can think or imagine. And all of what Christ did at that cross was so that we can walk in the fullness of the blessing. So when we partake, we are partaking of forgiveness. If you continue to struggle with the fact that you are a sinner, that's a sin, um, sin consciousness. You want to become conscious of the fact of what Christ did for you and how he covered you with his blood and you are forgiven. As we partake, I want you to realize anything that you need healing from, I want you to call on that healing. Let's partake. Now this is the cup of the blood that was shed for you for a new and better covenant. Whenever we drink of this, we drink in remembrance of the fact that as Jesus poured out his blood, it was pure, it was holy. And when we partake of this, we're partaking of the blood that is pure and holy, that washes over us and continues to work in us, cleansing, washing, and forgiving. Let's drink. The last thing I want to point out, and that would be in Romans 12, <clears throat> in Romans 12, chapter 1, and it says, In Romans. There we go. Okay. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer yourselves, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true, proper worship. Your true and proper worship now is to sacrifice yourself to serving your God. We just listen to all of what God has done for us. And now what we do in turn is become living sacrifices for him. I thank you for tuning in and I pray that all of what you have learned over the past eight weeks, actually nine weeks, because the first one I did on the power of the blood, I did not number it. But in all of this, I pray that you now have a, a depth of understanding in what your Savior has done for you. 
and that this will set you free in a way that you've never been set free before. God bless you. See you on Sunday. Amen.